This is the VoiceOver Marketing Podcast, episode 30. Wowzy, wowzy, woo woo. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the VoiceOver Marketing Podcast. My name is John Melly, and this is the podcast dedicated to teaching in depth and advanced marketing strategies for people in the voiceover and audio production professions. My goal is to help you make more money by showing you ways to leverage your time, charge more for your talents, and allow you to spend more time doing the things you want to do in your life. Hey there, it's John. Welcome to this episode. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I've got a long episode with voice actor and voice coach Dave Walsh. I want to get straight to that interview. So not a lot of me talking beforehand. Plus, I'm getting over a cold and I'm trying to rest the voice as much as I can. You might hear hints of that in my conversation with Dave, but was really excited to have him on the show. I just want to thank everybody for joining the VoiceOver Marketing Podcast group on Facebook. I also want to thank you that, as of this recording, the number of downloads for all the episodes of the podcast has topped 21,000. We've got a nice little palindrome going on right now at 21,000. 112 21112 downloads. Thank you so much. Thanks for spreading the word and sharing it with your friends and colleagues in the voiceover industry. It means an awful lot. I'm having a lot of fun. I've got a lot of things planned for 2015. I hope you're going to join me for the ride. Share the information with your friends and colleagues in the voiceover business. And it is a business. It's a fun business, but it's still a business. And that's what we're all about here at the Voice Over Marketing Podcast. I want to thank everybody really quickly for anyone who's expressed interest in the Voice Over Marketing Mastermind Group. I'm considering putting one together. I've had a number of people reach out. I've sent out an email with a link to an application. If you are interested in doing something completely different for your business this year, taking it to a new level, exploring opportunities that you've never thought possible, maybe never even considered possible for your voiceover business, shoot me or my cyber assistant, Mike, at mike at johnmelly.com an email saying, hey, interested in learning more about the voiceover marketing mastermind group. Got to have a certain number of people in the group to make it worthwhile for both the members of the group and for me, because I do spend a lot of time putting materials together to share with the group, and we do some coaching and one-on-one exercises. If you're interested, make a comment on the show notes for this episode, or shoot my cyber assistant, Mike, an email at mike at johnmelly.com. I said I wasn't going to talk long, so let's just go straight to the interview with Dave Walsh. Well, welcome back. As I mentioned in the first part of the show, my guest today is Dave Walsh. And Dave, he's on the show for a number of reasons, but he's had a career on both sides of the glass. He's laughing at me. It's like, it's just reading, right, Dave? Reading out loud? Oh, yeah. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's, that's, that's what I was told when I started. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he's had a career on both sides of the glass, both as a successful voice artist and as a studio executive. Dave is a a national voiceover talent. He's also been a director, and he's a voiceover coach. He's been involved in it for almost 20 years. He's been the signature voice of a lot of commercial icons, including AT&T, Honda, DirecTV, Shell, Mitsubishi, Wells Fargo. You didn't put these in alphabetical order for me, Dave, so I'm going to skip. No, I did shuffle them for you. (laughs) (laughs) He's also narrated a lot of television series like Big Brother, E! True Hollywood Story, TLC's Modern Marvels. I love this that show and yeah it's a great show vh1 news presents franchise he's also been the voice for abc nbc the wb basically the network alphabet soup and (laughs) (laughs) he's also more recently uh entertainment tonight fear factor and the biggest loser and another reason aside from his Overly ostentatious voiceover career. Oh he's, my God. he's been a studio executive and consultant, and he was, and this is one of the reasons we wanted to have him on the show. He was the marketing and research guru behind some of the most established primetime and daytime television franchises ever, including Entertainment Tonight, the entire Star Trek TV franchise, the Montel Williams show, the Maury Povich show, Cheers, and Frasier. So, Dave. <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you for that opening. <laughs> thank you for that opening so much, John. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And but really, thank you. And uh, in case people don't know, I first met Dave at. That's voiceover, which was back in November of 2014 uh, with Rudy Gaskins and Joan Baker. And uh, you were one of my judges for the audition spotlight. I was. Great, great opportunity. That was, that was, a, that was, a, fun, that was a fun day. It really was. I, I, I got to say, I mentioned it in an earlier episode of the podcast. I had this, once I went in for the audition, I had this kind of low-level low adrenaline thing going, saying, okay, there are two more panels to go, and then they're going to announce this thing. And I finally, I was sitting there. It was such an interesting setup, that whole audition process, that, uh, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on all around us and then we had to kind of the folks who auditioned had to wait to see if we were the final six and so I had this like low level adrenaline thing going like okay manage my expectations but also keep the energy up for if I made it and there were two panels and I actually started to nod off in between both of them not (laughs) nothing against the um the, the panelists there because they were great and the content was awesome but because of the timing of the audition and and, and the next event we didn't get a chance to eat anything so there no, was and you crashed yeah <laughs> yeah totally so totally man that's where I met Dave and uh, we were talking after the event and I said hey I'd love to have you on the show and he said yes and so here we are and thank you absolutely absolutely and, and just also to kind of from the from the judge perspective for some of your peeps and you know the, your regular followers of the podcast that you know one of the things that you experienced and the other finalists experienced and I don't know whether and I'm sure John had mentioned this to all of you that that the process was two pronged that they did the initial the initial group of 40 people that we listened to and the, the final six that we got down to is that you guys performed the spots you you narrated the spots in front of an audience of 300 people, yeah, 400 people, which normally, like, the truth is, and we all know, being in our booths, that we normally don't work that way. So it was the additional the additional adrenaline and influence of the room that, you know, and Joan actually mentioned that to the audience, that this isn't the way people normally audition. So I, I commend you guys for that as well, because I, I've never had to audition in front of 400 people. <laughs> so it's I, I, dude, I'm telling you, it was, it's uh, my hat off to you and the other the other finalists because that's a huge thing to 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 do. And uh, you guys did beautifully. It was really it was phenomenal. Yeah, and it, it was. It, it was a lot of fun. And I I, I mentioned it to Rudy. I sent him a message afterwards just to th- thank him because Monique is actually the person who won the contest. Yes. And I'm going to try and get her on the show. We've actually exchanged messages, so she's going to be on an episode of the podcast as well. But for me, I won regardless of whether or not I actually won because to go up there yeah. and I, I said to Rudy, I slayed some dragons. You know, as you mentioned before, we're in a booth frequently it's by ourselves sometimes you're in there and there's a client and the agency's watching and listening and all that kind of stuff and directing what they want to hear from a piece of copy but a lot of time we're here by ourselves doing things maybe directing ourselves and sending stuff out and the feedback you get is when you get paid <laughs> and or maybe a nice job or something like that absolutely you know um, but it was very it was affirming to go and compete go outside your comfort zone and to get to the level that you know I did and the other finalists did it was really really cool so I, I I would encourage and I have said in a previous episode go to conferences take advantage of opportunities because you can only grow from them absolutely yeah. and I think the other thing too and this this kind of segues into a chat about marketing in the sense that when the six of you were on the stage, this was the first opportunity any of you guys had been able to hear other people's interpretation of the one piece of copy. It was one piece of copy that the six of them read. And the thing about that is what you got to realize is the authenticity with which each of you interpreted the copy. No one was a copycat right. of any of the other five. So it just kind of is a great example just of how when you bring your own authenticity to the table, that's what the buyers are buying. That's the thing about this is because they're looking for that authentic 
enter that answers to the message that they're looking to convey. And it's everybody, a lot of the times that people, it's what you said at the top of the show was, uh, are we just reading? And the <laughs> problem is that the misnomer about voiceovers that people think, and this is, you know, people, everyone from his mother that feels that they can join the bandwagon and then realizing when they get in, <laughs> oh yeah, it's not exactly what I thought it was. It's, it's performance. It's really creating that world for the audience and inviting them into it but it's the world that you create. So that's what differentiates your marketing brand, obviously, from somebody else's. Before we go too far into the topic of, of marketing and voiceover, can you tell everybody mm. your story? How did you get started in this world? You're from the Boston area originally, but you're now out in Cal- California. And you used to, you interned for a local station here. But could you ch- just share your story with the listeners? Sure, absolutely. I I had a love of the microphone since I was a kid. I mean, I used to write and create radio shows uh, since I was probably 13, 12 years old. And my parents, when I was in high school, I had created a, uh, a station moniker. It was Boss 101 was the name of it. It was WBSS. And we did our own, I did my own IDs and commercials and promos as well as in and out of uh, the liners in and out of songs, and wow. and so even so even in high school, the love of the microphone was just awesome for me. So I came to California, and I had uh, I had an uncle who worked for Columbia Records, who was very well known in the Boston area. In fact, Sal and Jimmy, and Sal had encouraged me to get into radio, but said, just know that if you're going to work in radio, you're going to work out of you know Bismarck, North Dakota. You're going to work out of Cheyenne. You're going to work out of Dallas. You're going to work your way up the chain and my other love was television so my my heart had taken me to LA right out of college and went to work in the television industry but about three years into being here about 25 years ago I came upon a book called Word of Mouth which is written by a very well known uh, animation director named Susan Blue Sue Blue okay. and Molly Ann Mullen Word of Mouth is still in, it's still in uh, is still being published Sue is an amazing accomplished director and, and I've known for quite a few years. So I bought the book and there was a picture of a microphone on it and that's what kind of lured me to it. Mm-hmm. I didn't really know anything about the voiceover business. I knew about radio, obviously, but not voiceover. And in the middle of the book were pictures of some well-known voice actors at a, at a recording session. One of them being Bo Weaver, who's a household name in the industry. Sure. Uh, Tom Pint, uh, a gentleman named Tom Pinto as well. Tom is very well-known as well particularly in the promo and commercial world. And at the job I was at at the time, I'm flipping through the book and mentioning the names, and I mentioned Tom's name. And the woman in the next cubicle said to me, did you just mention Tom Pinto? I said, yes. And she said, that's my brother. And the building that they recorded in was three buildings down from where I worked. And she said, would you like to meet him? I said, yes. And Tom and Nick O'Mana, who was his partner at the time, and Nicky himself is so well established in our business theirs was the first workshop I took 25 years ago and literally started in the industry that way and started to network and got my first agent a few years after that and uh, started that's how I just kind of gradually worked my way in and at the time 23, 24 years ago it wasn't uncommon for people you, you were pretty much getting into signed by agents by your demo that's really the thing that was the definitive marketing piece that you were signed with. You you really didn't go in and audition for agents to become signed by them. They listened to your demos, and that's how it went. At the time, demos were still on reel-to-reel and just graduating to cassette at the time. It It was a different time in our business because it was very insular. We had, you know, basically New York, L.A., Chicago were the major markets. You pretty much had to you know, pretty much you had to live in one of the major markets to work in voiceover because there was no internet, there was no digital, there was no anything. Right. So in our business then it was even more important to have representation, to be in a major market. And I, I'm wondering if some of our listeners today, you guys who have come in in the new generation of voiceover in the digital age you know, I saw, I might as well have to be rocking in a rocking chair with my flannel shirt. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it, it, and I think about this is that the opportunity now is unbelievable compared to what we had 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. 
So it's uh, I've been I've been lucky enough to be able to be on both sides of the time capsule to know what it's like to work in a very smaller and a smaller pond and now in a much larger pond, which has affected the bigger markets. It's affected New York, LA, and Chicago quite a bit. How so? Uh, you know, like you said, we said before about about the buyers, is that um, the buyers realize that they have a wider market, a, a larger pool of talent, mm-hmm. and in the smaller markets, because of because of technology, people, you know, clients that I have that I coach, people that I've known in the business for quite a few years in D.C. and Atlanta and Dallas and Kansas City and a number of the, of them regional markets. There's some amazing talent across this country. There really is. And it gives an opportunity for people, and that let's not leave our beloved Boston out of that list, yeah. that uh, it gives people an amazing opportunity uh, that they, did, they wouldn't have had 10 years ago, even, even maybe even five years ago. Right. Because it's become, even the technology, not because of just the technology, but the hardware and the software has become more available economically, financially for people to invest in home studios. The thing that hasn't changed is the need for good quality performance. Right. And yeah. I think that, you know, and you, you mentioned in your last podcast about uh, negotiating a rate, uh, you, you know, negotiating rates with the buyers, which those of us that have come from the agency world have never had to do. We, we, it's become more of a challenge for us because you know, we're used to agents uh, brokering the deals for us and managers, and we still do. Mm-hmm. And I commend, you know, people that have to negotiate those those rates. And I think that your point's a great one, that the most important thing is that the quality of the performance and the quality of your work as a talent, really, that that's a huge factor in how you negotiate those rates. Because when you become that talent that the producer, you know, it's a team effort. You're working with producers all the time that the more you know the message they're trying to send, the more they're going to rehire you. The more that you make their job easy, yeah. not because you take on their work, but because when you make their job easier as a team effort, they're going to hire you back. Right. People want to work with people they want to work with. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's interesting. You said so much there that... I'm just, I don't really know where to go. Part of it was, well... <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it was, it, was, it was really good because I think part of the problem, and what I talk about in other episodes, is avoiding the commoditization factor of voiceover. Because there's so many more people involved in it because of the technological advances that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you also mentioned the need for good quality performances and i think before we got started we were talking about you know it isn't just reading it's performing but bringing your unique self to it but also needing the training to be able to get that unique self to it and that's one of the things i was talking about in the last episode is that i believe that every person involved in voice over brings their unique set of life experiences in part in their performance it just has mm-hmm. to color it in some way uh, because of their different knowledge that they've had different experiences the things that they can relate to and what i try and share with people is that there are different ways to avoid being put in the quote unquote commodity market of voiceover people and the way you do that is to differentiate yourself through your own experiences and your training. Whereas if, you know, I was talking with a, a gentleman who owns a video production house. This was several years ago. And he was talking about YouTube and how there was a time there where people were in the video production world, you know, corporate productions specifically, not necessarily for broadcast, but where they were wondering if they were going to have to compete against YouTube. And the people showing, throwing stuff up on YouTube. And he said, there's still a need for the quality of creating a story arc and being able to tell the story and for high quality stuff. And I think, I don't know if the voiceover world is starting to get that way. I don't know. My sense is we might be turning the corner a little bit on the, uh, uh, you know, I'll do it for 25 bucks or I'll meet or beat anybody's lowest price. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. What do you? No, no. But I think that it, it, I think that because there is there's even a, a site now where you can do you'll do it. The, the old cliche phrase is a dollar a holler. 
Yeah. And there actually is a site where they're offering voiceover for a dollar. And I, I got to tell you, <laughs> it turns my stomach. It, it's and I, I this this is an area where you know none of us that have worked in this business for years who this is we treasure this business. Those of us that are lucky enough to work in it are so blessed. Yeah. We are so blessed because it's a it's such a it, it it used to be an enigma. It used to be this thing where you never saw faces, and now. Even particularly, I mean, even if you're working in commercial voiceover, our agents and, and, and producers are asking to have headshots. Yeah. Because we never have it. I mean, you know, people would say it's a face only radio could love. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's not that way anymore. It's like, it's a business where, you know, movies like I Know That Voice and... There, in a world. Movies like that, in a world. Yeah. Uh, you know, when Lake Bell created such a, a great, uh, the screenplay was wonderful. And... And it opened up so much about the world of voiceover that, you know, people are wondering who it is behind those microphones. And it's, it's we, at 20, you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have cared. Right. You know, but now because of social media, because of so much that's available, people are really curious about this business. And to those, com- to that commoditization of the business, you know, there's a part of me, I don't ignore it at mm. all. But right. I think we have to look at it in the sense that it is changing the financial structure of our business. But at the same time, I still value the core of our business, whether it's uh, our performers in the major markets or in the smaller markets. I think there's plenty of opportunity for everyone. And I think that it's just a constant, how do I put it? I think it's just a constant monitoring of the business and realizing that when you lower the floor on a rate, you're lowering in that floor for everyone. Yes. So just, and, and the thing is, it, it's, it's hard because when you're a performer, and that's why we have agents, God bless them, managers, because this is, I leave the financials to them. But when you're on the front line in the smaller markets or you're in a right to work state and you're, and you're you're negotiating rates yourself, and this gets into the nitty gritty of what you talked about last, last session, it's a challenge. Because yeah. you don't want to lose the work. You don't want it to go to somebody less than in terms of financials. Um, so it, it's trying to toe the line there, which, you know, it, it affects the whole business. So I think you're smart, and, and I really appreciate it and value what you said in the last podcast about, you know, understand the value of what you do. Because are there jobs I have turned down because the rate was too low? Yeah. Yep. I've turned jobs down because the subject matter was not something that I felt comfortable voicing. And it was a, these were national campaigns, not campaigns, but in individual spots. And I turned them down. Right. Because, you know, the work will come around again. Just because you turned uh, a job down because of a rate doesn't mean something else is going to take its place. Yeah, I talked about yeah, I talked about the similar thing in terms of, you know, if you if you're presented with an opportunity that goes against your values and your ethics, you know, what do you do? And I can't yeah. remember the um the episode number on that one, but yeah, I think if you're in this business for any length of time, you're eventually going to run into that. Yeah, you will. It's just a part of the business. So, right. um you know, there's there's that, but you had mentioned and I'm just losing my train of thought here. You had mentioned Oh, uh, talking about your your own life experiences. Yes, and it's very true because my the core of the way I, the way I coach my clients is something that I call the true tell. Yes, and, you had mentioned that. Let's talk about that. Yeah, the true tell is basically uh, just it's the, basically the core of your authentic self, which I know a lot of people. You know, a lot, a lot of gurus uh, uh, in multiple businesses, public speaking people, wh- whatever the business is, motivational speakers, a lot of people will say, just be yourself. That is the hardest thing for people, <laughs> professional and non, to tell somebody to be yourself. I wake up and look in the mirror and say, who the hell am I today? I have absolutely <laughs> no idea. You know, it's like you're telling people to stand in front of an audience of 500 people at a, at a seminar, or, you know, a corporate retreat or whatever. Just be yourself. Yeah. It's hard enough for the lay person to do it. But I think in our work as actors that, like you said, everything in your life experience is going to help define who you are as a performer. And to me, that's what defines your true tell, the absolute core of who you are and how you feel about people, brands, products political views, social views, psychological views, 
whatever it is, that's going to, whatever product that you are promoting, narrating for, whatever it is, your personal beliefs are going to shift your perception of it and therefore will change your read. The hardest thing, the most important thing for any actor and the basis of when I, when I work with clients and prepping copy is to get clear and call yourself on your stuff. Call yourself on if you were if you're doing a spot for Pepsi for Coke United Airlines a politician call yourself on it i like it i don't like it i don't care the most important thing is to be clear about how you feel authentically about what you're talking about okay and then people will say well Dave, if i don't like coke then what am i supposed to do the bottom line is any commercial that we're we're promoting it's not about the product it's about what is the emotional takeaway because our business is all psychologically based. The whole business is emotional. Mm -hmm. If I buy this Coke, if I buy this iPhone, this Samsung Galaxy, if I buy such and such, I will feel cool, hip, connected, in the know, more educated, more intelligent, more appealing to men, women, whatever. Right. The product itself has that connection. And what we're actually conveying is the emotional connection, not necessarily just the brand itself. So the importance is if we try to act as, if we try to become something we're not, it's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Okay. Which is a little bit different than people think coaching should be. And for me, it's saying to actors, you're working too hard. Stop working at it like this is a chore. This is, a, this is so much fun as a business. It's about becoming more connected to who you are as a performer and how you feel about the products. Because what you're selling, the message you're selling or, or communicating, you're telling, you're not selling it. The message you're telling is universal. It's the emotional connection. And as actors, if we have to make substitutions, it's, it's very Stanislavski, it's very actor studio, but if you have to make a substitution within the same emotional connection, that's the way you get through it. You make the substitution, but you're still connected to the product emotionally. Huh. You're telling the story authentically. So you're you're trying to be your true self to let let's just use the Coca Cola example. And if you don't like Coke or you have a philosophical disagreement with soft drinks or whatever, but you're hired to do the thing and you're gonna do the gig, you use the same process. Let's say you're a, a super duper nice person and you get hired right. to portray a villain, you know, like a mob gangster assassin or something like that and right. a lot of people really relish those roles because they get to be something totally different but you still need to bring yourself to that so how does that all work well what happens is if you're doing it as a kid i know you're like wait a minute how about if i'm, if I'm playing the villain i get it yeah but the thing about the most important thing is is that let's take a character any character we portray as an actor Actors will say they'll jump into the character skin. They want to live as Meryl Streep's a perfect example right. of that. She did, a, she did a movie several years ago called The Devil Wears Prada. Right. Meryl Streep said to Anne Hathaway the first day of shooting, the first day of prep, and, and Anne said this in a press interview. Meryl went to her and said, for the rest of this shoot, don't talk. I'm not going to be talking to you. I have no desire to talk to you. I will be condescending to you. I will do everything. I she basically, she, in, she took on this character huh. and was the character through the entire production, even offset. So what I'm saying is, is that Meryl adapted the true tell of the character and lived that true tell 24 set. Well, as long as she was on set, she lived in the character. Yeah. So when we play a character, a villain or whatever, if you're to truly play a character authentically, you need to live in their true tell. So that involves subtext, pre-life, breaking the character down. What is the, what are the traits of the character like we do for any good character? Mm -hmm. work. And then once you actually create that, then you're living within the true tell of that character and it's unwavering. The second you jump out of character, the second you don't believe the true tell, the audience reacts to, Dad, I didn't totally believe her. Yeah. I didn't totally believe him. The same process with voiceover. Once you actually develop the true tell of the moment, and of course we don't have enough time to go into all of the steps, which might make people a little confused, yeah. but the bottom line is, is that I found personally in my business that when I really speak authentically, and I say this to my talent too all over the country, 
particularly for people in home studios, when you don't have the luxury of a director on the other end of an ISDN line in an audition, and you have to MP3 your auditions to the client or to your agent or whomever, when you find that true tell connection, it internally feels effortless. You're not trying too hard. You're not throwing it against the wall every five minutes and saying, let's try it with this angle, let's try this approach. When you get connected to it, this creates even more independence for you in the booth at home because you're not spending two and a half hours in a booth with 15 takes trying to figure out which one to send. <laughs> I'm you know laughing because I've, oh yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, it's like the, the sweat, the time we've spent in a, in a, in a, in a, in a booth, in a cave, it just cuts the amount of time it takes you to break the script down, get in the booth, find the read that internally, connectively, you feel connected to, that you find the takes. You may cut it down to two or three takes, choose which one you like, and send the MP3. Right. So it's really more about creating that feeling of freedom within the booth, but also more efficiency in uh, getting your auditions out and booking the job. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. This is the reason I say this to people. This is why they don't invite me back to dinner because they keep saying, what is he talking about? <laughs> people, we won't invite him back to dinner. He's too deep for me. I don't, I don't get it. He's, he's, he's too deep. What's wrong with him? He's way too deep. <laughs> I'll bet he reads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That's all right. Did I just say that out loud? Yeah, I did. Um, okay. I think he reads. <laughs> Reads good. Um, Real good. We have covered a lot of marketing aspects in this because we're talking about marketing ourselves, booking the jobs, and like you just said, maybe shift gears a little bit and sure. talk about marketing in general because you bring a, a ton of marketing experience and knowledge to the table. Anything that you see on a regular basis that people are making a mistake doing? Yeah, I think that, uh, hmm, well, I don't mean other one on a regular basis, but I think that probably the most common mistake... Yeah, that's probably a better way to or, put it. I think the common mistake is that, um, particularly if you're marketing on your website, that I think that when I look at demos and I listen to a promo demo, particularly promo and trailer seem to be confusing to people. Also, uh, narration in terms of industrial narration, which is obviously more corporate, corporately uh, geared versus broadcast narration for Discovery Channel, TLC, E, blah, blah. Right. The most important thing, and I've, I've heard this from several casting directors, on my website, if you go to it, there's, uh, we, I break the demos down very specifically and making sure that a promo demo sounds that it is a promo demo. Some promo demos I hear have trailers on them. Some narration demos have industrial and broadcast mixed in. Because these producers and the clients are shopping, and especially if you are marketing yourself online versus having a representative do it, it's really important to make sure all of your work is separated. Mm -hmm. so in other words, promo is only promos for television shows. If you're marketing for affiliates, uh, if you're doing local affiliate promos, local affiliate promos should be on their own demo. National promos should be on their own demo. Trailers should be on their own demo. Because what happens is everything starts getting confusing. Okay. Because every, every marketer will look for what, what they respond to. So they go to your website and they see things laid out really easily. They'll go right to them. Okay, that makes and sense. I had, a, I had a casting director actually say to me, thank you for making your site simplistic. I got in and I got out. I, I think it's lovely that we put all this information about, here's my background, what I do, here's pictures of my such and such. I'm like, that's great. But the bottom line is, producers are looking to get in and get out. They don't have time. I mean, they want to know more about you, obviously. But the, what they're looking for is the read. Right. So there's there's a fine line between giving them your personal information and marketing your brand and getting them the goods that they need to listen to. Somebody once said to me, and I thought it was great, is you build your brand with each sale. You do. A lot of people will spend their time on, you know, trying to design fancy logos and 
and putting that on all kinds of stuff. And yeah, that's important. But really, people will get to know and identify that brand with you based on the quality of the work that you do and then the repeat business and the word of mouth and all of that. Do you, yeah, do you I agree. agree? Yeah, I do. I think I think that, you know, the more that somebody works with you, you know, it's like you're doing a dance. You're doing a relationship dance. Yeah. You know, we're going on the first date and, you know, are you paying? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> giving, you're not giving the whole thing. You're... We're getting into bed together for the first time. It's kind of, and I mean that facetiously, obviously. Sure, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, it's that thing where we just need to know whether we get along. Do we do we work well together? And and that's what creates your repeat business. But I mean, you have that ability to make that first impression. This is your Match. dot com website. This is your dating website. Yeah. You know, this is that impre- impression you want to give and get them to send an email, send an audition, send a whatever. Again, there's so the saturation and, and the commoditization. Your word was beautiful. Mm. The commoditization of this business reduces some of the cachet. And for us, those of us that work in this business every day from our home studios, regardless of what city we're in, we want to keep that cachet. Yeah. And we have an ability to really control that brand. And, um, like you said before, this is your value. Know your value of what you do. This is a really, it's a very specific business, and those of us that work in it are just very blessed. So treat it like your baby, because it is your baby. Right. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. You mentioned something about controlling your brand. What do you mean by mm-hmm. that, and can you are you comfortable sharing maybe a couple of things that you do to control your brand? Well, I think for me it's, the authenticity of my brand now is part of working as an actor, but also working as a coach. And it's kind of, I've kept the same brand for the past, pardon me, for the past 10 years, not even 10, maybe it's about maybe eight or nine years. And it's worked. It's very simplistic. And just because I, you know, I have a W in my name and, you know, obviously the second part of the W is a V. So right. keeping it that simple, now granted, not everybody's going to have the same thing. Right. It keeps it simple, but protecting your brand, uh, is that, that was your question about how do you protect it? Or control it, I think was the word. How do you control it? Yeah. I think it's being aware of how the market, how the business is changing, how the reads are changing, how the market itself is changing, and keeping yourself abreast of how to shift. I think we all should constantly be, not constantly, but every once in a while, we should all be coaching. We should all be under the hood looking at how we can make it better, make it different, raise the bar. That's how you protect your brand. Yeah. Because you don't want your brand to become outdated. You don't want someone to go, oh, yeah, well, uh, yeah. I don't think so. You know, it's, 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 the whole, it's the whole book, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah, okay. Have you ever read the book? Yes, yeah, a while okay, ago. But so it yeah. Is like, yeah, it's like the mouse that doesn't follow the cheese being moved and stays and dies. You stay and you, you either move or die. So, and I, we've, we found that with some, of, some, some older um, veterans of the business, some who would complain they weren't working more, they weren't booking more, and part of that was because they weren't evolving the read. The read changes and shifts over over time, and you know, and factors around the world will change that. I always say that my actors stay abreast. Look at look at the results of what's happened in the last week, and you know, whenever when this airs, obviously it'll be, you know, at a few days since it. But the Paris the Paris shootings and what's happened in New York and so much of what's happening in our world, you and I talked about it before we started the show, Mm. that these things affect the culture, and the culture affects advertising, advertising will affect the read. So there's a trickle down, that's also how we protect the the brand, because we're smart enough and savvy enough to be part of the turn of the culture as it shifts. Interesting. And that's, that's our job, that's part of what we do. We are the messenger of the message. Ah, I like that part of, you know, yeah, I like it. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, you haven't worked in production for as many years as you have. You've seen how styles change. Design has changed. You know, part of your, your, your other life is literally creating that, that, that artwork, that audio artwork. And you know how that's changed over the years. 
Oh, yeah. Even radio, just the whole sound of radio. I, I mean, it's just, there used to be those Drake jingles, you know, the multi harmony jingles that would, you know, the jock shouts and all that kind of stuff for the different yeah. voice talent and all that, or the air talent that's on a particular show. That's all gone. It's not there anymore. It's all a lot of imaging and, and different ways of saying the same stuff, but it's being said differently. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. And I think that. And I think I've said this too, is that even though some of some of your listeners may be in smaller markets, they may be in larger markets. It doesn't matter where we are anymore. Because of the internet, it has leveled the playing field in terms of exposure information. So in other words, if you're working in Florida or you're working in the Midwest or wherever, I remember several years ago there were talent you know, the networks themselves wouldn't hire promo voices that couldn't come into the networks to work. So the, the benefit I've had in L.A. is working at networks where I would just go into the studios and, and work to picture, work right with the promo producers right in the, in the editing base, mm. which was amazing. Then several years ago, NBC was one of the first networks to actually hire a promo talent outside of L.A. ISDN. Oh. Uh-huh. And the networks, the, 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 the cable networks, Food Network, some of the cable networks had already been doing that, but the major broadcast networks, the, the, the major five, really weren't comfortable with hiring their talent. I mean, I did promos for the Food Network over the phone, so I, they were much more comfortable doing it. But the five majors, it took them a while to get used to that. And when that kind of happened, it changed the, the, the playing field. So what I'm saying is, is that even in the smaller markets, information about what's a hit show, what's a show that's on its way out, what's a great movie, what's a new movie coming out, a new documentary I'm going to narrate for, any background information you can find online. None of us have an excuse to not know anymore. Yeah. It, if you're audition, you know? Yeah. Google. We just... <laughs> Google, Google is your buddy, is your friend. Yep. That it, it, but, but it's also, the cool thing about that is, it makes me much more comfortable to know that I have a resource to go to and not have to guess. I can't tell you the number of times where you get a piece of copy and there's a, a person's name or a product or something that's you're not quite sure how to pronounce it. And you can yeah. go and type it into Google and you could probably find a video of somebody mentioning the client's name or or the product's name or you can actually hear a way a, a, an MP3 of somebody pronouncing it for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is how you say quinoa. <laughs> it's not <laughs> quinoa. <laughs> oh, quinoa. Yeah, exactly. You say how do I say that? Yeah. You know, or acai. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you really have no excuse anymore, which kind of, sorry to say it and crassly, kind of sucks. Yeah. Because you used to be able to kind of get away with, oh, sorry, I couldn't get the information on such and such. <laughs> Whereas now, you know, and this is another way you protect your brand, because again, like you said, they will hire you back when you're that much smarter. Because like they know it. they know you've done your homework. Very fun. That's interesting. Yeah. Anything else yeah. you can think of? I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've been very generous. No, no, no. Absolutely. I, I, I just think that, you know, the most important thing, again, is being authentic in your work. And I think that the confusion sometimes for people is, but can't you use different, vo- don't we use different voices in commercials and promos and things like that? We do, but it's basically you're shifting the story, not the voice, is that if you shift the story, and this is getting a little ethereal, but this is what I say to every client, if you shift the story, the voice will follow. Because when we, whenever we tell a story, we never think about how we're gonna tell the story, because if the visuals are vivid enough, the voice will come along for the ride. <laughs> I like that. that we don't, we don't say, like, we're sitting at a party, like, at this point, this is where I'm going to do the reveal. This is where I'm going to use my different voice. This is where I'm going to go, ha-ha. It, you, you don't even do that. After you've told a story, people will say, damn, John Melly told a good story. <laughs> but you have no idea how you told a good story. You just know you told a good story. Right. Because that's how you feel after you've told it. We all know those stories we love to tell. And what I say to clients all the time when you step out of the booth in Topeka, in Birmingham, in Atlanta, in Dallas, in, in Detroit, wherever you are, 
when you step out of the booth and you've told that good story, that's exactly how you should feel each and every time. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, it's kind of it, that. That's the fun part of it. That's what makes it so much damn fun. <laughs> that's Does awesome. that help? Yeah, no, it, it's it it's a totally different take on what anybody on the show has ever talked about. I mean, it's just, and it's it's so important because really go back to the very beginning when we first started talking it's about you it's about bringing your unique self and how you tell the story that's what you're marketing and right in your ability to adapt or at least share the story in a way that the client wants you to share it that's that's the skill that's the that's the stuff that you can learn it is, and it's the comfort, really quickly, it's the comfort you have with being yourself, because we live in a world of fear. This is a world of, we're, we're just constantly, every day, so afraid of showing who we are, because if we put that part of us out there, we're going to get our hands slapped and told, it's not good enough, it's not this, it's not, it's not, it's not, as opposed to putting it out there, sticking your neck out, and it's not too much of a risk. It's basically showing who you are because at the end of the day, if you come home exhausted, if you step out of that booth, and I swear to you, John, if you step out of that booth at the end of the day and you're exhausted, yeah. you've worked too damn hard. Because I'm not saying it should be completely with a physical tax, it should be physically taxing and all, but you come out of there satisfied. You come out of there saying, I've really put my best foot forward as opposed to, I think this is who they want me to be and it's not me, but I'm gonna do it anyway. You know how that feels internally. It feels kind of crappy. It feels, that maybe it feels crappy. It doesn't feel right. Something feels off. Right. Because you're trying too hard. If you just bring that part of yourself to the table, your voice will follow along. It'll follow along with the story. Got, and you won't have to work so hard. You just, I mean, you just opened up a topic that we could do a whole other show on in terms of the difficulty in being yourself and how there's so much working against you. You can't be all things to everybody because anybody who's achieved anything worthwhile in their lives has plenty of detractors. No, it, it, it's, a world of, it's a world of subjectivity. I mean, it's, yeah. just, it, it, it's how people, you know, and I say this about our business, is that, you know, and I had a, a, a coach at one time who had said to me, Maurice Tobias had said to me, they're shopping for what they want and it's not a personal thing it's a, it's completely subjective is that it's not that you that you don't measure up that you're you are less talented than him or her or whatever bottom line is it's this is what fit for them at the time and the problem we have as human first of all as actors and then as human beings is just kind of like someone's told me that i'm not good enough no yeah but that's not what they're doing that's not what they're doing, and the problem is we internalize that. So it, it's a matter of, like you said, there's so much negativity in this world, and people are so quick to defend or to antagonize. It's like when you, when you just come from a place, you just know when you're having a conversation and you're totally grounded in what you're saying, you feel awesome. Yeah. You feel unbelievably awesome, and that's so specific to our business because – so much of it is predicated on, I want you to like me. I mean, the entertainment business is how we are as performers. Yeah. But the bottom line is, when you come to the table and you just own it, it doesn't get any more delicious. It's awesome. Yeah. And like I said to you, this is why I don't get invited back to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll invite you back because uh, I've enjoyed having a conversation. And who knows, you know... <laughs> I hope our list. I'm yeah. sure our listeners have too. I hope so. I you, hope so. No, this has been great. Do you have any links, or if people want to learn more about you and your services as a voiceover coach, Dave, what's the best way for people to reach out and find out more about you? Uh, they can go right online to WalshVoiceOverCoaching.com. That's W A L S H VoiceOverCoaching.com, uh, and all the information there, um, email, etc., and. Please, uh, guys, reach out. I'd uh, love, to, love to chat with you. So uh, that's the best way to get in touch. 
That sounds great. And I'll put a link Absolutely. on the webpage in the show notes for this episode for people to do that as well, make it simple for them. It's interesting. you know. You got to, I did a survey of the listeners of the podcast, and it wasn't a super scientific survey, but it shows the importance of it because what it does show is that you are not necessarily your customer. And I listen to podcasts on my smartphone. And I figured everybody else did too. But I found out that yeah. close to 50% of the people who listen to this show are sitting at a, a computer. And they've got it playing in the background while they're doing other stuff. So, uh, you know, that's why the show notes are so important is so that, you know, you can provide quick links for people to access stuff. And sometimes people will make notes and go back and link back later. So that's why I always like right. to do that. No, that's smart. That's smart. And that, that's, a cool, that's a cool fact. I, I would have thought the same thing, that more people are listening on a smartphone on the go. But they're sitting. But they're sitting at the desks doing it. Well, I think part of it may be that they're in a home studio, and they're yeah, working from true. home. And it might just be the the nature of the the, the typical listener to this podcast. I don't know, but um, I found that to be interesting. So, but I think the great thing about this, and to commend you before we send them, before I before you kick me out of your kick me out of your studio, did it figuratively. Yeah. I thank you for, for providing this kind of an opportunity for people because it's, uh, you know, I, I think that the, in the digital world, it's it's kind of brought this community more close that you can have these kinds of dialogues, that people have these, these forums to be able to find out information that, you know, we didn't have. I mean, we, we did it the old-fashioned way with the two tin cans and the string. Right. Which, you know, and now that I live in both worlds now, I think it's awesome that you know you can provide something like this so uh i, I thank you for that it's, it's very cool oh well thank and, you i appreciate it yeah. i have a ball doing it i mean it's a lot of fun yeah it's just it's it's just kind of you know you're creating a service and, you, and you're putting it out there for people and it makes you feel good so that's great and, and i really can't thank you enough for uh, for having me on and being able to share with the, you and the, and the listeners well the pleasure's all mine and i think we got the better end of the deal dave so, no offense, but oh, <laughs> I really appreciate it. So. Oh, you're welcome, my friend. All right. We'll talk soon. Uh, thanks again. I appreciate it. Our program originates in the Boston studios. We hope you'll join us again. Until then, we bid you au revoir, keep your chin up, and the best of luck. Well, that's it for this episode of the VoiceOver Marketing Podcast. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to it at voiceovermarketingpodcast.com so you'll get notices of new episodes. And please share it with your friends and colleagues in the voiceover world. Also, it would be a huge help if you'd like this podcast and rate it on iTunes to help keep it near the top of the list. Feel free to share your comments and questions about this episode and future topics you'd like discussed at voiceovermarketingpodcast.com. And if you'd like more information on one-on-one -on -one coaching with me and mastermind group opportunities where we focus on growing your business, feel free to drop me a line at my cyber assistance email address at mike at johnmelly.com. Thanks for listening. Now go out there and share your voice with the world.